Hi there, and welcome to Raylene Math. In this video, we're going to take a look at a differentiable piecewise function, and in particular solve the problem, what values of the real constants a and b makes this function differentiable everywhere? So to recall, the word differentiable really breaks down to the phrase able to be differentiated. And when we differentiate, we're talking about finding a derivative, which is a tangent slope. So we're saying that a curve or a function has a single and finite tangent slope. And that's really just calculus speak for saying that the curve is smooth or locally linear, because when we zoom in far enough at a point of tangency, um, locally linear means that the graph looks like a line, and that line is called a tangent line. Let me introduce you to the three parent non-differentiable functions. The first one is the absolute value of x, and the reason this function is not differentiable or smooth is because we can zoom in at the origin far enough and never get a single tangent line. The left-hand derivative or tangent slope is negative 1 as x approaches 0 from the left. The right-hand derivative as x approaches 0 from the right is positive 1. And when we have two finite but unequal slopes, the graph is a corner. Now, if we're not careful, we might assume that every function, every corner graph has a maximum or a minimum point. But I'm going to build another corner graph by piecewise functions. And we can see here that as x approaches 0 from the left and the right, we have a corner because if we zoom in at the origin, we don't get a single tangent line. We get two tangent lines with different finite slopes. But the purple slope is a positive number, and the blue slope is also a positive number, and so we're not getting a change of direction from increasing to decreasing on the function, so we don't have a maximum or a minimum point. This is a corner that is neither a maximum nor a minimum. Right, so now the next type of non-differentiability is the basic or parent cusp. The cusp, when we zoom in, also looks like two different tangent lines, one which is decreasing and the other which is increasing. So we can see that we're getting two different slopes, or left-hand slope and right-hand slope, two different one-sided derivatives. But if we turn off the axis and we continue to zoom in, we see that eventually this graph looks like a vertical line. We know that the slope of a vertical line is infinite, but we are partic in particular getting a negative infinity slope for the left-hand branch and a positive infinity slope for the right-hand branch when we zoom in far enough. So this type of function really fails to have um, a derivative because the left and the right-hand derivatives or slopes are not equal and they are infinite. So that's about as badly behaved as a graph can get for not being differentiable. The last graph that I want to introduce you to is the parent vertical tangent function. If we zoom in at the origin far enough, the graph is looking like a single tangent line. So that's good news, but again it's looking like a single vertical tangent line. So the slope is not going to be defined because the slope is infinite. In particular, this graph has a positive slope at every x-coordinate except at the vertical tangent because the graph is increasing, so the slope or the derivative is always positive. Meanwhile, at the origin, the graph has a vertical tangent line, so the slope is positive infinity. Now, I could take a look at the graph of negative x to the 1 over 3, and let me just turn on the axes again. If I zoom in far enough, we see that the line is a single tangent line, but its slope is negative infinity. And so for this reason, we say that the function x uh, to the one-third or negative x to the one-third is not differentiable because the derivative or tangent slope is infinite. So let's apply this information to our problem. What values of the real constants a and b make the function f differentiable everywhere? Well because we have the piecewise function is a quadratic or parabola graph and a linear or line graph those graphs are smooth everywhere. The only point of, uh, on the domain that we need to consider then is at x equal to negative 1. So we want to specifically restate the problem which says to solve for a and b, which are contained in the reals, such that f is differentiable at x equal to negative 1. We don't need to check at every other x-coordinate because we know about polynomials that they're smooth and continuous everywhere. And so the first thing we need to know about a function being differentiable is that it has to be continuous. If the function is not continuous, then we can't zoom in at a point of tangency to get a single tangent line. So for f to be continuous, we have a few things that have to be true. 
And those things are that f of negative 1, the height that y is when x is negative 1, must equal the height that y approaches when x approaches negative 1, namely the limit value. So the function value equals the limit value, and because we have two branches, I'm going to break apart the limit value into the left-hand height and the right-hand height. I am not going to call this the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit, because later on I'm going to define slope as limit, and I want to distinguish between height and slope. So this gives me some equations that I can work with, and knowing that I've got two unknowns, I'll need some equations. I also know the second condition is that f is differentiable, this is given to me, and I want to work backwards from this given information to solve for the a and b values that make it so. So I want f prime of negative 1, which is defined as a limit as x approaches negative 1 of m secant, which is going to be y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. I want that to exist. So to exist means to be a single real and finite number. And that means we're going to have to look at a left-hand slope and a right-hand slope. So we're going to have to look at these two piecewise branches of the tangent slope. And so let's just take a look graphically to see what happens on our piecewise function if we just pick some random values for a and b. Here I've set up the graph and the random values for a and b are just initially 1. And so we see that the function with these random a and b values is not continuous. So we could just lift up that red graph or pull down that blue graph by three spaces. Let's pull the blue one down three spaces. We see that the graph is continuous. But then if we zoom in at when x is equal to negative 1, we don't get a single tangent line. We do get two tangent lines, each of which has finite slopes, but we don't have a single tangent line. And so these values of a and b didn't work. So I'm actually going to take away that negative 3 that I added in and then just go back to my graph. So we want to work backwards with the conditions that we have, namely that f is continuous and f is differentiable, to come up with two equations to solve for the two unknowns. So the first thing I'm going to do is use my, diff my con continuity equation and state that f of negative 1 is going to equal the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left of f of x. And I also know that f of negative 1 is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right on f of x. Now when x is negative 1, also when x is approaching negative 1 from the left, I would use the first quadratic expression for f of x. So in fact the first equation is a repetition. The left side and the right side will give me the same thing. So I need to use my second statement that f of negative 1, namely negative 1 squared plus 2b, equals the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right, and the expression I substitute for f of x is ax plus b. And so then I end up with an equation that says 1 plus 2b is equal to, now I directly substitute the negative 1 for x, and I get negative a plus b, and if I simplify the equation, I'm going to take the a over, so I'm going to get positive a, uh, subtract b as well, so I'll get plus b equals negative 1. So that's one equation that I can use to solve for a and b. So I need a second equation, and from that I'm going to use the differentiability condition, namely that f prime of negative 1 exists, which implies that the left-hand derivative, or the left-hand slope, coming from the limit definition, is equal to the right-hand slope. And so inside the fraction, I'm going to put my m secant calculation, which is going to be y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. So x minus negative 1 is x plus 1. And what I have here are different pieces of the f of x depending on whether x is less than negative 1 or if x is less than, uh, sorry, greater than negative 1. However, each piece of the limit definition of the right-hand slope and the left-hand slope involves f of negative 1. And f of negative 1 only occurs when x equals negative 1, and so that's the top expression. So I'm going to substitute f of negative 1 with um, negative 1 all squared plus 2b, which is going to give me 
1 plus 2b. Now, we might have been able to see from before what f of negative 1 is, but we can also see that it wasn't simplified any further because it depended on the value of b. So the best I can refer to f of negative 1 right now is 1 plus 2b. So now we're going to work down in a column to make our equation. And working down in a column gives the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left. I'm going to replace f of x with the red circled expression, namely x squared plus 2b. And I'm going to subtract 1 plus 2b. And because it's two terms worth, I'm going to put that in brackets. And that's all divided by x plus 1. And I can right away see that the 2b minus 2b will simplify and leave that for now. We do the same thing for the right-hand derivative or the right-hand slope. Notice that I'm also not going to call it the, left, the right-hand limit because I have a height limit from the continuity condition. These limits over here are limits of the height. And now we're dealing with limits of secant slopes. And so the limit of the secant slope is the tangent slope. So in this case, for f of x, I'm substituting the linear ax plus b expression and subtracting 1 plus 2b. OK, so uh, we can tidy this up and see what happens when we try to evaluate each limit. The numerator is going to give me x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. And if I directly substitute in here, I would see that I get 0 over 0. Fortunately, the x squared minus 1 can be factored, and I'm actually going to erase that and put that factoring in now, since I'm running a little bit out of room. And the x squared minus 1 factors as x plus 1 times x minus 1. And this is great news, because then I have a common factor of x plus 1, which is what actually gave me the 0 over 0. So reducing that x plus 1, and then continuing to work down in a column, I can take negative 1, substitute it in for x, and get an answer here on the left of negative 2. And then continuing on the right-hand side, I see that I get the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right. I have ax plus b minus 1 minus 2b. So ax minus b minus 1 all over x plus 1. Now we can see that the denominator will be 0 if we directly substitute. So we need the numerator to be 0 so that we can reduce the indeterminacy. So at this point, I'm going to use my equation 1 and isolate b, which says that b is equal to negative 1 minus a, and substitute that into my second equation. So replacing that for b, actually I've got a negative b here. So if I wanted to, I could say that negative b is equal to 1 plus a, which is a lot easier in terms of the signs. So now we get the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right of ax plus a plus 1 minus 1 all over x plus 1. And so we see that the 1 minus 1 simplify, and we can factor an a out of the x plus a, ax plus a. And here we end up with a common factor of x plus 1, which gave me uh, the 0 in the bottom and the 0 in the top that I needed to determine. So what's left here in this overall fraction is just a, and the limit as x approaches negative 1 of the constant a is just the constant. So it ends up giving me that negative 2 is equal to a, and if I back substitute into my equation for b, which said negative 1 minus a, we get that b is equal to negative 1 minus negative 2, which is positive 1. So now we can go back to our grapher and substitute these values of negative 2 for a and positive 1 for b. So we see that we've got the b already set to positive 1, but the a is not. And those choices for a and b make the graph continuous at x equal to negative 1. And if we zoom in at the point of tangency, we wonder, will we get a single tangent line with a defined, i.e. finite and single slope? So when we zoom in far enough, we start to see a single tangent line emerging, and the slope is finite. If the slope were not finite, the line would be vertical. So there you have it. We've solved for the values of a and b that make the function f differentiable and naturally continuous at x equal to negative 1. If you like the video, click like, leave a comment, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for checking out Raylene Math.